In this video, we are going to capitalize on our investment into learning those several rather technical results in the previous videos, namely Pontryagin's principle of maximum and the necessary conditions of optimality in the free final time case. We are going to use these to solve the problem of time optimal control for a linear system. The cost function is simply the difference between the final time and the initial time. This fits easily into the integral format of the cost function. The integrand is the integrand L is simply 1. We consider linear state equations parameterized by the matrices A and B. With no loss of generality, we assume that the initial time is 0 and the state at the initial time is given. It is strictly required that the state at the final time is 0. An important component of the problem specification is that the control signals are bounded. Here, for notational simplicity only, I assume that the absolute value of each control signal is upper bounded by 1, but you could certainly modify the subsequent development to consider some different bounds. Note that without imposing these constraints the solution to the problem will not be useful at all. Unlike in the discrete time case, in the continuous time setting we can bring a controllable system to the zero state in no time, I really mean immediately. But this would be at the cost of using infinite pulses or Dirac's as our control signals. Obviously including the constraints is a must here even from a theoretical perspective, not to speak of the practical one. The Hamiltonian, using the Eastern notation, if you like, is lambda times ax plus bu minus 1. The Hamilton canonical equations, the state and co-state equations, are straightforward to write down. They are complemented with the third necessary condition of optimality, the Pontryagin's inequality. If we now substitute for the Hamiltonian, the general form of Pontryagin's principle specializes into this. Cancelling on both sides the terms that do not contain u, we are left with the following inequality, or actually set of inequalities. Or these can be reformulated as the statement that the optimal u at every time t maximizes the linear function lambda star transpose times b times u over all vectors u whose individual entries are within the interval minus 1, 1. Can you now identify the optimal u? My general advice for these situations is to shrink the problem to the scalar case first, just to get some insight. Here we would uh, get lambda star times b times u, u between minus 1 and 1. Obviously, in order to maximize this, maximize this linear function, you must assume either its minimum or maximum admissible values, depending on the sign of the term lambda star times b. Here it comes in the vector form. The sigma function is applied here element-wise. That's it. Almost. But what we have so far, thanks to Pontryagin, is actually quite impressive. We have learned that the optimal control can only assume values 1 or minus 1, or in general between some u max and u min, nothing in between. The control switches between two extreme values. In the control theoretic community this is nicknamed bang-bang control. Have a look at an, at an example with a single input. The B matrix is then actually just a column. Lambda times B is uh, then just a scalar variable. This product can evolve like the red curve in the figure and the corresponding optimal control is trivially related through the signum function. Looking at this example, you may, perhaps, start wondering about one particular possible degenerate scenario. The question is, can the red signal actually vanish on a non-trivial interval? The control would then be undefined because the signal function is. The answer valid in our particular situation is no, provided the system is normal. 
Normal system or system satisfying normality conditions is controllable from each input. I will skip further the discussion of this issue. Currently, I do not even include it in my lecture notes, but I encourage you to have a look at it elsewhere. Liberzone's Lewis or Kirk's uh, textbooks. If the normality conditions do not hold, the control signal is not determined by Pontryagin's principle and some other techniques must be used to find the control over such interval. We call the control over such interval singular arcs. It's certainly not uh, an artificial problem interesting only for theoreticians. Quite the opposite. One of the classical problems that exhibits this kind of problems is the popular Goddard rocket problem. You may want to have a look at a survey paper by Limebeer and Rao. Well then, let's move on to a computational example. We consider a double integrator. To help develop some physical insight, I label the state variables as y and v, position and velocity, respectively. The control signal then corresponds to mass normalized force or acceleration. The B matrix is just the column 0 and 1. Hence, the switching function lambda times b becomes lambda 2. And the optimal control is given by signum of lambda 2. But we do not know lambda 2 yet. Uh, true, but we can attempt to get it analytically using the co-state equations. And we get that lambda 1 is a constant function and the lambda 2 is a linear function. Both are parameterized by two coefficients, c1 and c2. In order to determine these coefficients, we need to bring in the boundary conditions into the game. One of them is that Hamiltonian is zero at the final time. Recall that this is always the case if the final time is free and subject to optimization. If we now write down the particular Hamiltonian and use also the boundary condition that x at the final time is zero, we get the condition that lambda 2 times u at the final time is equal to 1. Verify. But since u at the final time, as well as at any other time, can only assume values 1 or minus 1, lambda 2 at the final time has the same value. Combined with the fact that lambda 2 is a linear function, we can draw a few possible instances of a lambda 2 function. <coughs> Pardon. As a matter of fact, we do not even need to know the particular trajectory for lambda 2. In other words, we do not care about the particular values of c1 and c2. What we have just learned is enough to get us going. In particular, the co-state lambda 2 goes through 0 at most once during the whole control interval. Consequently, the system will experience at most one switching of the control signal. Recall now that since u can be either 1 or minus 1, we can easily characterize all possible trajectories parameterized only by the initial states. Let's have a look at these trajectories in the y-v domain. We need to eliminate time from the expression for the state trajectories. We can express t from uh, the expression for one state variable and substitute into the expression for the other. This is what we get. A set of parabolas parables with respect to the velocity, parameterized by the initial states and the control signal 1 or minus 1. The figure just shows a few samples, obviously. The blue curves correspond to u equal to minus 1 and the red ones correspond to u equal to 1. Among all these, there are two special curves. I highlighted them by drawing them thicker. These represent the set of all states such that if the system starts at these and chooses the appropriate value of the control, it slides to the desired final state, the origin, while keeping the control u constant and not changing it, not, not switching it. We combine these two curves into one and call it switching curve. The position y is 
one half times v squared for negative velocities and minus one half times v squared for positive velocities. Equivalently, we can characterize the switching curve with the compact prescription y is equal to minus uh, one half times v times absolute value of v. We are just a few steps from our goal, which is designing an optimal control strategy. Let's have a look at the state portrayed once again. Say, we start at the initial state 1, 1. We know that an optimal strategy will bring the system to the origin in 0 or 1 switching. 0 switching is out of consideration unless the system is initially right on the switching curve. So we can aim at a strategy that brings the system to the switching curve first and then slides uh, and then switches the control and the system slides along the switching curve all the way towards the origin. But the system must reach the switching curve with no additional switching. Remember, just one switching at maximum for optimal control. Now examine the situation at the initial state 1 1. Well it's um, not visible for from the figure but if we choose u equal to 1 the state vector would evolve towards the upper right corner, away from the switching curve. I should have added some arrows. Anyhow, if instead we choose u equal to minus 1, it starts evolving in the direction towards the lower right corner. Obviously, the optimal control starting minus 1 switches to 1 upon detecting that it reached the switching curve. And that's it. Formally, we can write this control algorithm like this. Let me emphasize that our control is truly a feedback control. Equivalently, we can come up with a bit more compact format. In words, the algorithm just checks if the state is above or below the switching curve, sets the control signal accordingly and keeps it until reaching the switching curve, then switches and waits for the system to reach the target. Done. A block diagram of the implementation of the optimal controller, if you like. And the evolution of the optimal control and the two states, the velocity and the position. Wasn't this a nice reward for all our efforts? Well, Life is not easy and the presented solution is not without troubles. The particular trouble, which is however common to most if not all control schemes based on switching, is called chattering. Chattering is a fast switching between two extreme values of the control signal. It may occur as the system is sliding along the switching curve, but the measured or estimated states appear to be even very tiny little bit off the switching curve. This problem gets amplified as the system is approaching its target state, the origin in our example. An immediate heuristic fix is to introduce some insensitivity band along the switching curve. This would introduce, of course, hysteretic behavior into the controller, which makes the analysis of the closed loop behavior challenging. Another approach, and a systematic one, can be found in literature under the name Proximate Time Optimal Switching, PTOS. You can find it in the popular textbook on digital control by Franklin, Powell and Workman, but also in some papers. The topic has been heavily investigated by the hard disk drive community. The seek phase of the positioning task for a read and write head must be done as fast as possible. And surprisingly, the models of dynamics are not much more uh, complicated than the double integrator that we considered here. For a more comprehensive overview, feel free to consult the classics by Athams and Falp. They give explicit solutions to various other low-order models. And that's it. This completes our introduction to Pontryagin's principle-based time-optimal control. True, it's only for linear systems where we can solve the state and co-state equations analytically that we can come up with some feedback controller. In the general nonlinear case, we can essentially only rely on numerical methods. The outcomes are then optimal trajectories. These methods of so-called numerical optimal control will be covered in the next 
lecture.